one of the things that people don't understand is you're developing God in different stages and there's um, ways of growing in God and if you don't avail yourself of the ways of growing in God you just don't grow and there are people who don't understand that there's no growth in their life and no spiritual development basically basically because there is no realization that God has, has actually given methods and ways of development and people don't understand that if you get a, a baby um, you know you have to get a baby by an <coughs> conceiving one and you have a baby now that baby has a natural way of growth first of all it needs its mother's milk uh, and it's very important that it has its mother's milk uh, not cow's milk not cow and gate which used to be in my days when um, years ago um, and then you, you bring a baby onto certain types of food and then you can bring it onto more food and the child needs exercise, the child needs to develop its faculties well in your Christian walk it's identical, you need all those things but unfortunately uh, the churches today don't teach people how to develop so what you have are people who are birthed into life and they last for maybe three months, four months, or five months developing in God. And all of a sudden there comes a cut-off point. And then their development, development in knowledge, but not development in their spirits. And so there is a totally cock army development in the person. They never develop. Now if you turn with me to... Uh, <laughs> What I'm going to do is over the weeks, uh, and I, I worked it out that we could do it in a 12 week period. Uh, now 12 weeks, as there were 12 apostles, we thought we'd have 12 weeks. Um, there's nothing uh, remarkable about 12 weeks. It's just that we felt over 12 weeks. And I felt it would be good, first of all, to have everyone together and then to break down into groups which is smaller so that you could actually ask questions without being thrown into asking them in front of everyone. You could ask them to individuals. And, and uh, so one week we'll be here and another week we'll be in groups uh, in various houses, just so that you get the opportunity just to chat and it won't be a Bible study and it's not gonna be anything intensive. Give you a chance to get to know some other people who you don't know very well and to develop uh, cross-fertilization would be the best word for it in other words what I don't want everyone to do is sit in their holy huddles because in churches as in everything else people get used to certain people they get to know certain people and <laughs> then their friendships develop and it doesn't become a family now we had an advantage years ago but because we were under such opposition in Onga, and we ran a community association, and we ran the bar, and we ran the coffee bar, and we ran the <coughs> executive committee, and we ran the this, and we ran that, and we had to work to paint the place, and we had to fight, and you know, we used to get threats, and then we had to have uh, five people over six foot tall, to guard the premises at certain times from violent creatures and we got to know each other um, very well now the church doesn't have that opportunity now but the people who were there at that time learned some real principles in God of giving their lives and it's noticeable that they still have that attitude built within them from the early days because God did something very special and basically in any church a church is a family a family 
is not a church, but the church is a family. And God intends that a church should be a family. It always was that way. And obviously, families have babies. And families, babies develop and grow in <coughs> families. And the church has always been intended to be the place of fellowship and the place of growth and the place of development. Now that stopped when you had denominationalism, uh, when it came in with ecclesiastical ideas. Augustine was the one who took the whole, uh, you know, if you want to know, he, he took the whole thing into the ecclesiastical mess that it's in and, and Protestantism and Catholicism all sprung out of that. Um, Henry VIII wanted more wives and so you've got the Anglican Church, but the whole thing's pagan. And we're not part of any of that setup, and we never will be. Uh, and we have to understand that the church, if I want to be part of God's family, and I want to develop, the first thing I need to know is what family do I belong to? And the second thing I need to know is that the church is the mother. God is the father and the church is the mother. New Jerusalem is the mother of us all. The scripture tells us. And really, the place where I first of all can be nourished is within a church. And, and if I don't take the nourishment regularly and I aren't open to that nourishment, then I'll never develop in God. God has made a way and God has said this is the way. And, and I'm talking about a spirit-filled church where there's a true flow of God's ministry. Without that, there is no growth. Period. You just can't grow. And, and a lot of people don't understand. They say, but surely I can seek God on my own. Yeah, sure you can. A baby can go off and sit in a corner and ignore the rest of the family. But I'll tell you what. The baby will die of starvation. Because the baby needs his mother. And, and God has set principles in, to show us in the natural what's necessary in the spiritual. And it's interesting when you come to the scripture, you find that God has set principles down and said this is the way it's got to be. <coughs> and yet, we ignore those principles in the most vital part and, and we find that people don't develop in God. And the tragedy is you've got people who had a real birth and they've never grown in God at all. They're still babes. Uh, years later, I go to church after church and meet pastor after pastor and they've never gone beyond the stage of, of having an experience of God. They've never developed in God. There's no, no life of God in them. They've never understood how to take nourishment from God. Uh, I went to the AOG conference and, and the hardest thing to do was find Christians who had developed. I'm not saying that they'd never had an experience of God, but they'd never developed in God. There just was no development. There were just one or two I found who actually had anything from God and were flowing in God and knew how to flow in God. And in fact, uh, out of 6,000 people that were there, it was hard to find anyone who knew God at all and knew the ways of God. Now that's a terrible indictment, but that's how it is all over the land. And what I don't want to happen is we have two churches. One church where people are really alive in God and know the ways of God, and the other place where people come and they just learn and they get head knowledge but there's never any real development in their spirits. Be awful if at the end of your life you found that you failed ever to develop in God. You had a real experience of God and you had a lot of knowledge. And there are many people, when I went to Argentina, one of the things that really shocked me this time, I went, well, this time, last time, I went over. I, I went to the place and there were lots of people <coughs> who were there when there was a real move of God in Argentina in uh, six years, wasn't it? Six, seven years ago. I can't remember how many years. It was a real move of God. And there were people who had been back there 18 years ago who had never, ever developed in God at all. 
They just never developed. Or they'd seen it. They'd seen God do wonderful things, but they'd never grown in God. There just wasn't any life. And, and I began to wonder why. And God's given us the answers why. People do not avail themselves of what God says is there. Now, what we need to do if we're going to develop as some of you are new people and some of you are old people. But what we've all got to do is we've got to say, right, well I want to know how to develop and I want to use the means that God has given to develop in Christ. What I don't want to do is end up with head knowledge. And one of the problems is the difference between religion and Christianity. <coughs> um, you must understand this. What I'm talking about, Christianity, is a development in your spirit. And your spirit's growing strong, and you wax strong in spirit, and you learn to worship God in spirit, and the doctrine is not important so much as your spirit. Because we've got to learn to be a spiritual people. And one of the things you don't need to do is have everything worked out, and have all your doctrines worked out, and have all your ideas worked out, because you can do that and have no life and no light in your spirit at all. You can never come into God and yet you can have everything T's crossed, I's dotted, got everything right but death inside. And what I want to avoid is death inside. Another thing that is important to understand is behavior has nothing to do with Christianity. And don't believe that a certain mode of behavior means a person's a Christian. Because behavior has nothing to do with it. Behavior is a very outward thing. But I'm not interested in knowing a person after the flesh. I want to know that person after their spirit. And what they do outwardly is not relevant. It's what happens inwardly and what spirit comes out and what edge there is in what they do. That is what counts, not their actions, but their spirit. And strangely enough, someone might do all the wrong things and be right. And a lot of people do all the right things and are totally wrong. So... <clears throat> We want to come to the place where we realize that our lives are not based on outward performance. They're based on inward reality. And it's the inward things that we're going to concern ourselves with over 12 weeks. And I want to turn your hearts away from the idea that a Christian is a nice, quiet, smiling, ever so gentle twig. He isn't. And he's not polite. He's not... Uh, gracious, he's not dewy, he's not uh, he's not evangelical. A Christian, first of all, and uh, uh, let's make this plain, a Christian is a man. There's manliness in Christ. Effeminacy is an affront to God and it's an evil spirit force. And God wants men to be men. And there is a manhood in God, which I'm grateful for. And there's also a, a feminineness. <coughs> and, and that's a wonderful thing. And it's in the right place. And, and to be truly <coughs> feminine is not to be effeminate. And a truly feminine woman is totally different from an effeminate woman. And we're going to deal with that at a later time. It's important to know. There's nothing worse than seeing a man and woman. God deliver us from them. Uh, that's an evil spirit too. And that's how the devil works in this day and age. He wants everyone to, to change roles. He wants to switch things around. He wants to deceive us. He wants to tell us, you know, you can do it this way. That if you've only got to look at the way that fashion goes, you don't know the difference between a male and a female anyway from the back because they all dress the same in scraggy clothes. 
uh, and everything goes wrong. Now, basically, we as Christians aren't part of that at all. Our whole lives are centered on Christ and our lives are different. And so, I want you to start off by talking about your first experience and where you are. It's good to know where you are. And it's good to know where you're not. Now, to be a babe in Christ, or to be coming to be a babe in Christ, is a, a state that everyone has. There are people who develop and, and they're not really born. And one of the things, <coughs> first things you need to do when you realize you come to this church, I, I remember people saying when they've been here two years or two and a half years or three years and God really met them and they realized they just got converted. Well, they haven't. They have got birth. What had happened before is they had love and they had life, but they hadn't really got birth. And they've never been birthed into the life of God, and it, sometimes it's taken them two or three years. I know they've been baptized in the Spirit, they have all sorts of experiences, but basically they were never born again. That was their problem. They were just in the stage of being in the womb. Life was there, development was there, things were there, they could understand, they could hear, they could rejoice, but they had no life. Now you say, well, how do you get that from Scripture? It's quite simple, actually, it's in the Bible. And it talks about it all the time. It's just that because it's in the English and not in the Greek, you just miss it. And if you look with me first in the 1 Peter, um, in 1 Peter 1, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. This, uh, this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. Now I want you to notice you have to lay those things aside. Laying aside all malice. All guile and hypocrisies, and envies. Now those are things that spring up very easily in someone who hasn't been born, or someone who is uh, just born. Someone who's just born, or someone, the, the malice comes into the love, and into the heart. As does envy, as does hypocrisy. Now hypocrisy is play acting. Uh, you'll know how that if you walk into a meeting uh, and you don't want to stand out, you might, without really realizing it, begin to adopt the attitudes that everyone else has got. And basically, you can see people do it. They kind of hold their hands up and they're like that. And, and uh, you know, and now they play out. Now, there's nothing wrong in it in the sense of that everyone at some time or other, play it. Kids always do. But you've got to lay it aside if you want to grow in God. You don't fool anyone except yourself. And that's the awful thing. Now envy, it's awful, but we have this competitive streak in us. And, and people get envious of other people. They see them developing God, or they see an experience in God, and, and envy begins to get in there. Why should he have it and I haven't got it? Why is this? Why is that? Why, why you know, uh, the pastor paid more attention to him than he did to me, you know? Why don't he do this? Why don't he do that? I didn't realize it, but, but uh, people used to get upset if I prayed for one person and not for another person. Especially in Argentina, it's a habit. Of, they, they shout like cats down there. If Dad Miller goes and prays for three or four people and leaves them out, you know, I want to pray for them, I mean, that's just babyhood. 
and you've got to grow up and you've got to lay it start. And all evil speaking, now one of the things babes do is to defend themselves, they'll attack what's here. It's always the way it is. I don't expect any better of anyone because that's just the way people are. Uh, the way to defend themselves is to attack. <coughs> and they always attack truth. And they've got good reasons. And the thing is, God will give you justification for what you say. Uh, because, you see, you'll be like Bildad or, or Elihu or any of the others. We're going to go on with that subject, Joel, this weekend. But you can be like that. In other words, your whole carnal reason will justify what you say. And if you want to grow in God, you've got to just stop it. You've got to lay it aside. One of the things that the Pharisees could never grow in spiritually because they could look at Jesus and they could say, but you're a carpenter's son. But you were born out of wedlock. But who are you to teach us? You sit with wine, bibbers and glutton. But you eat and drink with unwashing hands. But and now they were all good causes, they were good things, they brought the precepts of, of the culture that Jesus was in. And therefore they said, well because of those things we can reject you. And in a sense, babes in Christ begin always to choose, and because they're carnal, they look at the carnal things and the outward things, and they make those an excuse for rejecting truth. <coughs> Because anyone who's gone on in God, those things don't even bother them. They don't even think about them. And as for our culture, it stinks. Let's face it. The culture of this nation stinks. It wasn't born in God. It wasn't birthed in God. It teaches people hypocrisy, and I hate it. And I don't want to be part of it. And if you want to be part of it, it's the culture of the world. But it's not the culture of the church, and we need it out of us, don't we? So we must never side with it. Then it goes on to say here, as a newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now the sincere milk of the word is the only way that a babe can grow. And you've got to desire it. And that word babe there in the Greek is brephos. And it's speaking of a babe who's unborn or new, just born. And you will find that an unborn babe or a just new babe needs the word of God to grow. But in order to receive that word of God, he's got to lay aside malice, guile, hypocrisies, envies, and all evil speaking. And then he can receive that word and then he can grow. And if he doesn't do those things first, there's no way he'll receive the word. He can come into a church and he can sit there, but he'll never receive anything. That's just the way it is. And without that, there is no growth. Without that, you can forget, a person will never grow. That is why the folly of charismatics, they say to people, get baptized in the spirit, no, but now go back to your church, which is dead, there's no life there, or go back to a church where there's no true ministry, no true anointing of the Holy Ghost, that person is being thrown out to die. It's like a mother having a baby, birthing a baby, and after a week just tossing it on a rubbish heap down the, down the street and saying, well, that's it, thank you, sir. That's an evil thing to do, but that's actually what's been done with loads of people who've had a real experience of God have been tossed in the rubbish heap. Quite an awful thing, isn't it? You have to be in a live church where there's a true, sincere <coughs> word of God coming, and it's the spoken word. Now, do understand this. It's not possible just to take your Bible at that stage and have that Bible and read that Bible and find life and life in want. God is a babe. You can't. Because milk comes from mother. Milk doesn't come self-manufactured. It doesn't come in tins from cow and get. I don't know if they're still in business, but they used to be, 
awful stuff. It doesn't come that way. The sincere milk comes from a church where there's a true flow of the Holy Ghost. Okay? So anyone who's truly born and God has moved on your life, you can only grow by God's methods. God's laid down the way, he says, this is the way you grow. Any other way, you can't grow. Now you all follow that. You don't need to be a great theologian, do you? That's obvious, really. And in the Greek, it talks about a babe, you've got the word prepos there. Now, you might say, well, Michael, how do you know whether you've got life or you haven't? Well, it's difficult. How do you know when you're born? Well, that's a difficult question because in actual fact, you can have life before you're born. If you turn with me to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, Uh, and verse 39 And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into the city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth and it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary the babe leaped in a womb and that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost now there is a babe in a womb reacting to the sound of a voice. So in actual fact, babes, before they've actually been born into God, will react to the word of God. <clears throat> and they can have tremendous joy and leap and jump and rejoice and still not be born. You'll find the same in Luke 2. The word there is brephos. Again, of course, you know the baby was unborn. It was in the womb. And you'll find it in Luke 2, verse 12. You'll find this is the baby, once again spoken of. But this is Christ. And he is born now. And it says... Um, and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. This was the babe. Born. Birth had come. Now I want you to notice the same word brephos. It was just born. And everyone comes and has to go through that stage. Every single person. We're born of the incorruptible word of God. And so you get into a church and you're birthed by that word. One day that word becomes living to you. But the strange thing is, you will hear the Holy Ghost speak and you'll have tremendous joy and you still won't be born. But you've got life. Once the baby is conceived, there's life there. And that life will come forth. God will bring a person to birth. Now there's no way a baby can bring itself to birth. There's no way a baby fights to get out of its mother's womb. It might kick as, as it gets grown, you know, eight months or so, it becomes violent. At nine months, it's pummeling on the sides of the wall saying, let me out! And, um, but you can't. The mother is the one who brings it to birth. The mother goes into travail. And in actual fact, every baby in Christ is birthed by the church, not by the individual struggling to get out. God sovereignly does it. You must be born again, born from above. Now you can't get above, God births you. And so, it's no good trying to work out, am I in the womb? Or am I just born? Or where am I exactly? What you need to know is you've got life. That's the most important thing. It's no good trying to analyze and work out exactly where you are. All you need to know is you're on the road. That God has met you, that the word of God is something you desire. You desire the sincere milk of the word and somehow you know you've got life. That's all you need to know. You don't exactly need to know what stage you're at. 
But you do need to know that you're taking and using the means that God's given you for growth. All right? You've all got that. You all understand. Anyone got any questions? It's all clear. Really? Is it easy to understand? Hmm? It is really, isn't it? It's straightforward. Everyone knows how a baby comes, don't you? I've delivered a few. Three. Two, I have to know. My own, of course. Okay, let's go on. Now, once you, you, you get born, then you have to develop. Now, the first way you develop is by the sincere milk of the word, and you can't grow unless you take that sincere milk, and that milk comes from the church. Now, there is no way that you'll get revelation. There's no way you'll get uh, knowledge outside of a living church. And if you develop wrongly, in other words, you feed on the wrong things, you'll get a malformation. It's noticeable that if you don't give a baby milk, the, the bones aren't going to grow right, the lack of calcium, the lack of this, the lack of that, and the baby will develop wrong. And any substitute milk, I don't care who you are, I'm telling you, any substitute milk in nature causes problems. Um, because the baby is attuned to feed off its mother, and there's a lot of immunities against disease are gained purely just by the mother's milk. And it's an important thing. Women don't realize it. That's why I'm dead against women, unless there's some real physical reason why a woman can't feed her own baby. Every mother owes it to that child to feed that child. Because there's something that only that mother can give that child. And it's important. Now that's clear in the natural realm, and it's clear in the spiritual realm. And the two are meant to be synonymous. And God says you can clearly understand the things of the Spirit because they're shown in creation. And then we go on. And the next stage that God laid down is the stage of nepios. The Greek word is nepios, N-E-P-I-O-S. Now, it's the nappy stage, if you like. And it's important to understand that there's a time when a babe can't do much for itself. Have you ever noticed that babes up to about two years old, the, the only thing they seem to do is to get things put in the mouth and shoot them out at the other end. And, and the mother's got the job of cleaning the rear end and stuffing the top end. And, and that's it. And, and development and growth just happens. And it's not, you know, it's a stage of Teething, it's a stage of everything. And, you know, they seem to do everything. <coughs> and, and, you know, there's, it's the stage where you have to burp and it's the stage. You wonder, you know, if you're ever going to live through it and you'll ever have a sleep a whole night and you, you know, all the types of things that the parents. That's why they have so many. <coughs> now, one of the things we have to understand is, is in this realm, and this is different, in this realm, you begin for the first time in your <coughs> life to get two things in your life as you grow. And you'll find in Matthew 11, Matthew 11, Let's uh, just go to Matthew, keep your finger there, go to Matthew 21. Uh, verse 16. And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have you not never read, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? 
Now the thing that develops when a person begins to develop into the Napios stage is he began, begins to be able to praise God. And praise is really liberating. He can open his heart and he can sing and he can shout and he can rejoice. And praise becomes part of my spiritual development. It's where I begin to get my muscles. Where I begin to try the first faltering steps of walking. Where I begin to open my heart. And praise is perfected out of someone who's come into birth, he's begun to enjoy the fruit of God's word, and suddenly begins to rejoice, and suddenly he realizes, and God perfects praise. And that praise develops and is perfected in a, a, a napios stage. And everyone needs to understand that you'll never develop in God if you don't learn how to really praise him. Because it's a natural progression in your spirit. And praise, without a real praise rising in your heart and rising in your soul, an ability to open up to God, you'll never develop any strength in your spirit. Your spirit will just remain stunted. Without praise, you cut yourself off. God perfects praise out of the mouth of babes and suckers. And you notice it comes out of your mouth. That's why I get worried when I look around the church and I see people who don't really enter in and really learn. I know that there's no real life there. And I know that there'll be no development there. Because development comes God's way. Now another thing that happens whilst the praise is going on, you'll find back in Matthew 11 and verse 25, <coughs> at that time Jesus answered and said I thank thee O Father Lord of heaven and earth because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and hast revealed them unto babes now at the stage of babyhood you begin to pick up your Bible and you begin to read it and God begins to show you things <coughs> now it begins to be a quickened word to your heart and suddenly, you're not so dependent on the mother for the milk and everything. You begin for the first time in your life to pick it up and you're reading the Bible and suddenly words quicken into you. Now I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. It becomes alive and you think, goodness me, and it just meets your need. Well, that is in the Napios stage. That's when you're developing. And the thing that should happen but stops is because people don't go on in praise and they don't go on growing in the spirit, what happens is they cease to find living food. That wonderful experience of opening your Bible and finding those words alive to you stops because people haven't really learned how to develop in their spirits and open them up to God in praise. And you enter into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. You enter his courts with praise. And in actual fact, in your life, you miss out the revelation side of things. And many people never develop on in God because they never learn how to feed on living food. And living food is essential for your growth. Not dead food, living food. <coughs> and it's always gained through a person developing in praise. And so God intended every one of us not to only to be a praising, rejoicing people, but also to be a people who could begin to receive from him direct. Now you still need mother's milk, and you'll still need food, and you'll get on to meat in the church, but you'll also get living food yourself as you develop, and God will give it to you. And it's a stage you'll go through where suddenly things become alive. Now I don't know how many of you have got to that stage where there's real life, but an awful thing is that I find many, many Christians never ever get to the Nephios stage. Nephios stage. They never develop till they can have living food from God. Now there are a lot of people that can read their Bibles and get things out of it and reason it out in the natural, but I'm talking about spiritual revelation. Now spiritual revelation is not something you see. You can't seek spiritual revelation. 
You can read your Bible and God by the Holy Ghost will quicken it to you. I find that, you know, for me, I, I have a shower every morning. And, and God will often speak to me while I'm showering, while I'm shaving, while I'm doing something, or I'm walking somewhere. And God will take a particular word and quicken it to my heart, or my wife will say something, or I'll meet someone, or something like that. And a word gets quickened and God begins to speak to me. Now that's down the road. But the way I began to develop in hearing God's voice was by praise and by reading the word and suddenly I find God had started to quicken something to me. Now, if you don't find the Bible's alive, keep reading it. And just abide reading it, get out of the word when, when you come to meetings, let that word feed you, because you'll come to the Napier stage just by sincere, having a sincere milk of the word, you'll develop. Now if you haven't got there yet, there's no great shakes, you will. Just wait. Learn how to praise, learn how to open your heart, and you'll develop those muscles and you'll begin, God will say, all right, now it's ready for a little bit of revelation, and you'll begin to slip things in and you'll find living food. You need a bit more than milk on things now. And you, it's very wise. It won't give you milk, uh, living food until you can begin to digest it. It will just stick you to milk. You say, milk diet for this one. And um, every time it comes around, it'll look at you and say, no, I still feed milk diet. But when you begin to develop in praise and you develop your heart, then you'll say, hmm, needs a bit of living food here. And then he'll give it to you and then it begins to develop person. All right, you'll follow that. That's another development in growth. Now each of you somewhere in those two, <coughs> or at least most of you, somewhere in those two. And those are the two I wanted to talk about, really. But we do go on to young men, and that's in Paleon and Technion. But let me say about uh, the babes in Christ, if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians 3, One Corinthians three verse one. You'll find what Paul has to say. He says this, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, as, as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able, for you are yet carnal. For where there is among you envies and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Now, there's a sense in which there's carnality in the babyhood state, and you walk like men and you behave and you judge in the natural and you think in the natural, but you've got to learn how to turn your life over to the spiritual. But the natural will still be there. In fact, the natural will predominate the life at that time because the life of Christ hasn't really developed in you very much and that's the way it is. Now, there's nothing wrong. You don't blame a babe because a babe in Christ is carnal. Just the way a babe is. Trouble is, when people should have developed in God and they're still carnal, then you've got problems. Nothing <coughs> worse than seeing an 18-year-old man pushed around in a pram. With that result. I mean, there's something wrong, but that's how most of the church are. They're pushed around in prams, and, and they're never developed in God. And you see, what the church is in is a hospital for, for malformed people. And most of the people that come here have never ever developed in God at all, and they're malformed, malnourished, and twisted. And it takes time. And basically, you have to go back to the beginning and start again. Paul said, I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. In other words, that life of Christ, which has got stifled, stunted, and totally shut off, has to be reopened. The life has to be reopened. And you have to begin again to bring them into the life of the Spirit. 
And it's, a, it, it's not an easy state. And the whole of the church's purpose is to get hold of people who some way they got missed, messed up or they had some stupid pastor who didn't know the back from the front or they got told they'd stay in a dead church or they weren't where there was a true flow of the Holy Ghost or they weren't in live ministry or they never developed into a praising church and a liberated church and or they went into legalism or they went into religiosity or they went into false teaching all those things well really you have to just start at the beginning again and say well i'm sorry but really we've got a travail in birth you see paul wrote to the galatian church and he said they've gone under law again they've gone back into legalism they were judging people on feast days. They were saying, you must do this, you must keep the law. They went right away from grace. And he said, now I've got a travail in birth and bring you back to the life of the Spirit. And that is what the church does. So now you've come here, and some of you have been here for, your, you know, within two years. The truth is, we're trying to bring you to birth. And I tell people it'll take at least two years before you really develop anyway. And for the first two years, the biggest thing to do is to pull down your ideas of how far you've gone. The second two years, you realise you haven't got anywhere. And the third two years, you wonder if you'll ever begin. <laughs> and the, 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 the good thing about it is, that you see, to really go on in God, you need to be little children. And everyone in the spiritual realm wants to grow up. But Christ said, except you become as little children, you'll in no wise enter in. And so, we as adults all try and be spiritual. We get our Bibles, we read them, we kind of got our doctrine sorted out. We want to be leaders, you know, we want to be an apostle or a prophet or a pastor or evangelist or whatever. And we all get those ideas. We want to have a ministry. We want to find our place in the body. We want to rule, find our expression. But God says, no, become like a little child. Jesus said, except you become like a little child, you won't enter in. And so what they're trying to do is get people back to babyhood. And then let them grow God's way in the Spirit. And let them take uh, the things that God intended. Now you go on to uh, childhood, which is Paleon and uh, Technion. And, and in, in that stage you'll know your sin's forgiven. You'll know you're forgiven. And, and strangely enough, a baby in Christ doesn't know much about sin and right and wrong. <coughs> If you try and explain to a babe who, who hasn't got full power of speech, uh, a nephios, no full power of speech, can't express itself, can't tell you its ideas, can't tell you its thoughts, it hasn't really got it all functioning up there, and have you ever wondered what a babe thinks? When they look at you and smile, they don't have words yet, they don't have comprehension. Have you wondered what they're thinking as they sit grinning at you? I mean, what do they think? And how do they think their thoughts when they haven't got words to kind of think their thoughts with? It's interesting to think. And that's why God can put in a babe in Christ revelation and stuff. The trouble is, people grow up too quick, they become... Uh, adult to quit and then they know it all and God has no chance to speak to them. And one of the problems with us is people try and work out everything and they want answers for everything and they want doctrines for everything and they fail to see that our life is a life in the spirit and not a life in our minds. And I don't have it worked out. I don't know very much about doctrine. I don't care much about <coughs> doctrine. Frankly, what I want is a life that works. I want something that's real and a relationship that's real. And for the rest of it, it's hogwash. And I don't want to grow up. It's more convenient to be a child and get regularly fed, isn't it? And not to have to go out and earn your living. 
and not to have to worry about the consequences of what you do and not to have to worry about how you're going to, you know, make next week's bills or pay the mortgage. I mean, as a child, you've got all the advantages in the world. Now, for goodness sake, become a set of children in the spiritual realm. Realise that what God wants you to do is not to be mature, not to be adult, not to be clever. He says, become like a little child and learn a myth. Now, as you grow up into young man who sins forgiven, you learn to abide in him. Uh, you love in deed as well as in truth. You overcome the evil one and you have to keep yourself from idols. That's another stage of development. But it's no good talking about higher stages of development when most people are trying to get out the womb. Is it? And some of you are born. How many of you here have found that you've picked up your Bible one day and it's really, suddenly, something's really struck you and it's come alive? Well, yeah. You know, see? And how many of you come to meetings and Sundays and it's as though that meeting's just been for you? Every word that was spoken was for you. Right. Now you see. So you've got life. Now you don't have to define how much life you've got or how little you've got life. <coughs> you don't have to define exactly where you are, but you're on the road. That's all we care about. Now, a young man just grows up by feeding. Babies just grow up and develop by feeding. And you become a young child just by taking the right nourishment. And that's all you have to do. And the church is there to nourish and to help and to encourage. And you grow into the family of God. You become a useful member <coughs> of the family. Not out of the family, not isolated, the true church is an enlarged family. And your loyalty is to Christ and to the church of God and not to your own family. Let me make that plain. Your loyalty is to God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. And He must be first. And you must put Him first. It is carnality and it is wrong for people to put family things first instead of putting God first. Because God's become your father, the part of the big family of God. And that's a wonderful thing. Now that doesn't mean by that that you totally ignore your family, but that your family takes its rightful place in all of it. There is nothing worse than people who it's family. And then it's church. But you see, the church is the family of God. And your place is a babe in Christ is to develop. And the only place you're going to develop is in the family. So that's what God's really about. And that's why you've come here. I hope. To become a child. To become young again. To become carefree again. To lose your inhibitions. To lose your great ideas of spirituality. And say, well actually, I need a dummy. I need, I need to really develop in God. I realize that my life has been stunted, my life has been wrong. And, and really, you need to, to get back. Now, may I tell you that there's, there's a stage further on, which is a mature son. And it's only the mature sons of God who are ever chastened by God. Now, do understand that the dealings of God in a person's life come to Huelos. That's mature sons. They do not come to babes in Christ. God has more sense. You do not take a babe in a pram and start beating his backside and doing this to it and doing that to it and trying to discipline it. <coughs> you leave it to go goo goo goo, smile at you and feed it and you let it play in the pram and bang its rattle and, you know, speaking tongues and whatever. And, and you know, the, the babe's happy. You let it come to a meeting, have a hallelujah and, and shout and dance and but God's not going to come into your life with tremendous dealings. Now the enemy might come in to try and destroy you, but don't think you're going to get the dealings of God early on, because God's got more sense than that. If your spirit's not alive, 
then what you've got is oppression of the enemy and you need to be free of it. Now God will liberate you and there's glorious benefits, the gifts of the Holy Ghost are there, there'll be deliverances, times of liberation, and you need to avail yourself of those. Don't get the idea, oh, it's the dealings of God in my life, it's not. They come for Huios, the chaste things come to the Huios. Uh, the sons of God, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, they, they are huios, mature <coughs> sons, they're not babies. And a lot of people have got the idea that as soon as you come to God, he's going to deal with you, it must be the dealings of God. But they haven't even got out their nappies. And God's not going to get his hands messed up trying to smack you. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing worse than a soggy nappy. I, I mean, it's crazy. And yet we've got the whole wrong concept of spirituality and we need to have it run in our minds and in our hearts. Okay? You all follow that? You understand? Right, has anyone got any questions? No questions at all from anyone. Must have been blank. Hmm? Well, to help you remember what I said, I've got typed out, and if you pass them around me a drink, you can have to each one. There's a list of exactly the scriptures, the points, and you can look at them, read them. So, okay? Well, you could have saved yourself the on that and you can uh, now I've gone on and I've also talked about the young men and the mature sons and if you're inquisitive you can look up and see the problems they have. <coughs> okay, it's all there for you. Now what I, what I really want to do is to encourage you all that uh, we learned this all when we first came into the church and we developed together and we learned about praise. And when I talk about praise, I don't mean what we've got currently in the church, I mean, uh, I mean praise. We used to get together when we first had the angelic visitation over in the Arts and Activity Center and we would praise God for maybe four, four and a half hours, and you had to be fit to be in the church. Literally, we'd dance, we'd sing, we'd shout, and the building would shake, and the windows would rattle, and the ceiling would go, and we just prayed and prayed and prayed, and God taught us, that was ten years ago, what praise was. Now, unfortunately, a lot of you have come in have come in when we've gone beyond praise in the sense, not that we've stopped praising, because you always do that for the rest of your life, <coughs> but the intensity of it and the level of it isn't like it used to be. Uh, and the reason for that is that as you go on and you, you put away childish things, and yet there is still that element of praise and rejoicing there and joy there. And what I do realize is the new people in, enjoy the meetings where there's real praise and there's openness, and it's important that they develop in that. Uh, I remember times when we'd just sing the first verse of the chorus and the power of God had come down and God would just bowl people over where they stood all around the room and then we'd begin to sing and rejoice and jump and shout and it would go on and on and on. Uh, meetings would go on to one o'clock in the morning and we'd be turning off the lights <coughs> and telling people they had to go on, we weren't going on. And, do you remember those days? Those were the days. And, and there, there was something precious but Now, you people have missed it in the sense that God was birthing the church then and, and it was a wonderful thing. Now, God has taken us on but you have to go through those stages. There is no what you can't do, and do understand this, you can't enter into worship, and you can't truly worship until you've gone through those stages. 
because no person until they've developed in their spiritual life and really developed in God can enter into worship because as you know it's impossible for two babies to come together and have babies they can't two babies cannot do it because they haven't got the ability to they haven't got the uh, capacity and all the faculties and what has happened and what is a big mistake is people come into this church and they see worship and they think they can enter into worship now what you can do you can flow along with what God's doing and you can get blessed and you can open your spirit up but in truth don't get all upset and say well I can't really flow in that if you're not at that stage you won't be able to but that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you it just means that you just haven't developed but you'll grow up just open your heart and flow with that which is going on and ask God to develop you and feed in the right way and praise in the right way and, and open your Bibles and read them and let God begin to give you living food and you'll grow. And when you grow, you'll suddenly find one day love will begin to flow and, and you'll be able to express love. You know, a baby gets everything given and, and its response to love is just by the benefits. But as you grow up, love is something which is a giving thing. And have you ever noticed kids, they'll come up and they'll be ever so friendly when they want some paint? Little kids, or when they want a chocolate, or when they... In other words, it's what we call covered love. And in actual fact, a lot of us develop covered love uh, when we're babes in Christ. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a healthy, growing style. And, and you don't have to get all uptight. And a lot of people get into condemnation and they say, well, I can see people weeping and broken before God and this happening, that happening, and I just felt cold, I couldn't get into it. Well, sure you couldn't. But that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you, it just means that just the time keep coming, you grow. And as you grow, you come in. So you're seeing a church ten years down the road with tremendous things happening in the past. And and you aren't gonna get there in ten weeks. You it takes time and thank God it does. You didn't all become the size you are, and the weight you are, and the intelligence you are. I'm looking at Rob when I say the weight you are, and the intelligence you are, by basically going one day into the kitchen and saying, right, well I want to grow to six foot one, I want to be 22 stone. I want to, and you just feed yourself and you force feed yourself and say, now it's going to happen. And there's no way you can force feed yourself in the spirit life in God. There's no way you could spend hour after hour after hour reading your Bible and fasting and praying and you won't develop at all. Right here. Because it'll be out of God's order. That's why a lot of charismatics, they get baptized in the spirit and they start to really think they're going to get the use of the spirit if they fast and pray and then they're going to get ministries and then they're going to get this and that and they go and they're going to see revival. They're twits. They're stupid. Because God is not going to give a loaded revolver to a baby. He just won't. And he's not going to give you authority in the spirit realm until you're grown and adult enough to cook it. And just enjoy being what you are. Because the pressure will soon be over. The responsibilities will come. And you'll regret that you never took advantage of the wonderful opportunity of just enjoying being a baby in Christ. It's a thing to be enjoyed. Okay, so that's basically what we're going to do now. I'm going to go over the next few weeks. We're going to discuss things like healing. I believe that every baby in Christ can come to God and expect to be healed. And we'll discuss the reasons why some people aren't healed. 
and how to receive their healing and you know the physical basis of healing that's physical mental and spiritual healing and i want to also go on and discuss the realms of the gifts of the spirit and how they function because gift, giftings basically uh come to babes in christ uh you learn you know you get tongues you get baptized in the spirit of your life and uh, and you can speak in tongues and all should speak in tongues and you can move in prophetic words you, you're not a prophet can move in prophetic words, you get interpretation tone. Those are, are, are basically in the Nakios stage. Now, as you develop in God and you mature in God, then they become part of your personality, part of your character, and part of your daily living, and the gifts will function in your normal life. Jesus did never kind of go and, and uh, stand like some Pentecostals do. Can you imagine Jesus? He put a multitude around him. And you know, he started doing the thing. You might. And then he said, sit down. <laughs> I mean, have you seen people do it? <clears throat> Dear Lord. <laughs> and, and it's just so ridiculous, it's laughable. It really is. Now it's just not like that. And, and the gifts of the Spirit have just got to become part of your natural life. They've got, but as a babe, they won't be. There'll be something that's accentuated, something that's outside of you. The anointing begins to rise, and, and that gift flows. Um, but it's in very much babyhood stage. You haven't got full power of speech. You couldn't really express it, so you open your mouth, and, and the words that God puts in just come out. And you haven't got much clue, you haven't got much faith about it either. But, you know, out it comes and, and off it goes, you know. And that's fine for a baby. And, and yet, there's the young manhood stage is different. And we'll discuss the way you develop in the gifts and how you can receive the gifts and how you can move in the gifts and, and what's happening. So that you, you get an understanding. The charismatics, you know, most of them are out of the womb. Every time they open the mouth, they get them out of the world. <coughs> but you, I, I don't understand what they're doing. Um, and, and, and it's ridiculous. But that's the way it is. And, and so God wants to teach us those things. And to develop us, we need to know about the gifts. And we also need to know how the church functions as a church. Body ministry, uh, as such, is is something that is totally unbiblical and we have to understand that body ministry has never ever been a biblical principle what has been a biblical principle is the fact that we are all members of the body and members in particular and we all are different parts of the body but body ministry as such you never find uh, the, the hand wants to do what the foot's doing. And you don't find that the ear wants to do what the eye's doing. But it's strange that when I meet people who believe in body ministry, they're all the mouth. <laughs> in fact, that's the only part of the body God ever has. They all want to say, that's step the Lord, and get up and preach. Now that is nothing to do with body ministry because where's the hand and where's the foot and where's the ear? And you see, they've taken something out of scripture and they've totally abused it and misused it. And they've got these cockeyed ideas. And so we'll go through how the ministry works in the church and, and give you some understanding and insight into those simple things. And then I also felt another principle we want to talk about is uh, the principle of, of the financial running of a church, how it all runs, why it runs, and the principles in God, because I've heard some people giving advice that's totally wrong, uh, over tithing and over giving and over love offerings and that, what exactly it means. And also I want to talk about the breaking of bread and how that operates and why it operates and the principles behind it. So that you get over a, a six week period a pretty good party version and you know where we've gone. 
Alright? That's what people ask for. Yeah. Could you just explain the end, Matthew? Yeah. Uh, Nepios need the fivefold ministry. Yeah, well, Nepios uh, are one of the things that happens when you're a babe is you get a revelation. And being at the nappy stage, you charge around uh, in your stumbling mouth with a rattle, rattling it like mad and thinking, I've found a new toy. And you've just got this revelation. And the trouble is, what happens, you go to an extreme. Because God said something to you, you think that's the whole truth. And you don't understand that it's one revelation God's given you. And it's not the whole revelation. And one of the things that we tend to do, and we don't understand, is that in, in revelation, truth builds on truth. It's line upon line and precept upon precept. But if you get a particular aspect of truth and think that's all truth, and you start looking at everything in regard to that, then you go out of balance. And babes in Christ get tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, and they need mature people to bring them back and say, hey, yeah, that's true. That's a wonderful revelation of God, but this is the way it fits in. And so it's for the realignment of the saints. In other words, it's for bringing people back to realignment so they're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Every time the spirit moves and they hear something, they think, this is it. This is the answer. And, and they go rushing off and, and they get themselves into all kinds of bother. Um, you had it in, uh, you know, the discipleship groups. You know, most of the apostles were just about getting to the Napios stage, and they get the doctrine of relationships. And so they rush around for the next six or eight months, relationships. We've all got to learn to relate to everyone else, and, and then we're all going to be one body. You know? But you don't. You learn to relate to Christ. And as you walk in relationship to him, so you'll have fellowship one with another. But they would try and build it. And then, you know, uh, you get... It's right now, and it's called submission. But we've got to learn to submit. All your problems are over. If only you submit. And you've got the babes trying to get everyone submitted. And then you get... Uh, the next thing they thought up was... Um, oh, I don't know. What? Oh yeah, the discipleship teaching. And then the next thing they thought up was meeting items must go. Don't come to meetings. Only have meetings when God tells you to. So consequently, they stopped having meetings. And people stopped coming. So they abandoned that doctrine after four months because no one ever came to meetings. Uh, so then they had... Dave Bansal, our prophet, with his rattle in his hand, bury your Bible in a polythene bag at the bottom of the garden and stop being religious. But it's blinking difficult reading it in a hole at the bottom of the garden when it's in a polythene bag. And so you starved, and, and then they found they had nothing to preach because they had done away with their Bible because it was being uh, religious. So they got that, so they dug their Bibles up again. And then they thought of the next doctrine, which was, um, well, I don't know, but it went on. And I'll tell you, I, I, whilst I, I knew what was going on out in that cockeyed atmosphere, I, I used to hear every three to six months there was a new revelation in God which was going to be the answer. And what they were trying to do was answer the problems in people's lives and get people to maturity and to growth. And they ignored the things that God had said would be their way in. The sincere milk of the word, which comes through the church and the body of Christ, and a true living relationship, then the growth and development in the spiritual life by perfecting praise out of the mouth of babes, and also the revelation beginning to come to the individuals, and 
They ignored those things, and because they ignored them, there was no growth. There was no spiritual development. They went into legalism, and they lost the life they had. They never developed. And then you see, the only way to keep babies happy is to give them something new. And because the apostles were babies, they were always desperate for the latest revelation. And, and over in America, they've got they've got people over there that have all gone this stage, and um, you know, prophetic words come forth. Now it's the formal dance, and so you get men in leotards, <laughs> no, in tights, and you get women in their uh, um, glowing dresses, kind of all learning how to go like that, and, and they call that dancing in the spirit. God deliver us from it. Uh, and, and it was awful. I saw them do it. And they'd do, they'd do these dances and they'd have this music and, and they'd float around like fairies. Do you remember it, Rob? Rob never was asked to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just in the shape of a fairy. Uh, but, do you remember that? Sorry. And, and, and there were all sorts of odd oddities that, that they brought in. But it was all because they wouldn't let the people develop in God's way, using God's methods. And therefore the church must always be using what God <coughs> says is the right way of doing it. We don't need gimmicks. Now, now, I think she had a revelation one night. She went to bed and that's good to get a bed at night. But she went to bed and, and she suddenly thought, banners. You know, and it came to a banners. So she got up in the morning and all the church had to paint banners. With this big cupboard. And they'd get these banners out, and they'd go to football camp, and they'd start charging around with the banners. And Ruth and I went to America, and couldn't believe it, could we, at Tennessee? All of a sudden, the banners came out, all over the place. It was like, you know, like the cop. And, and these awful banners. And I've seen, uh, I was lent a video. Well, they got the banners out, and uh, uh, they kind of quoted the scripture. We're terrible as an army with banners, and they look terrible. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't look like an army, and, and the banners looked fatuous. <coughs> but you see, it was a new gimmick. And for six months, the church are happy, like little babies with rattles, running around with banners. But after a time, they realize it hasn't actually performed anything in their lives. They haven't developed in God. No one's got really healed, saved, met, delivered. And they start thinking, well, maybe. So they put their banners away for a year or two, and then every so often they'll just bring them out, just make sure the moths haven't got them. And, and that's it. And that's how things are developed. But we don't want to go that way. We don't need gimmicks. We need God. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want the reality. I want to know that people are saved, people are healed, people are filled with the Holy Ghost, and I want to use God's name which is a sincere milk of the word and to, to grow and develop in him and to have the life from him and I don't care for any of the gifts they can stick them all and that's my concern and uh, if you think I'm critical I am I'm terribly critical of such things I think it's blasphemous to start waving things at God I, I, I have no joke when you watch this video and you would not believe that people could be so imbecilic. But they are. And it's anything gold. And that's why we don't have women art singing solos. We don't have a show of, of some, you know, we're going to have a choir. Now, I like choirs when they sing in tune. And, and I like robes. I think there's something nice. I like Benson's robes. I wasn't so sure about his bare feet, but his robe. Mm -hmm. and, and, but we don't want to go into religion. And we don't want to go into those things. We want to say, Lord, give us the sincere milk of the word that we might grow thereby. 
Let us have praise perfected out of our lips. And let us really develop by the revelation you give us by the Spirit. And we'll grow in the Spirit. And we'll grow in love. And we'll grow together as a family. And we'll begin to take our part in the family and our responsibility in the family and realize that God birthed us into the family of God. Okay. So that's all I've got to share. <coughs> now what, what we did do is we thought it would be good to break down into groups. So next Wednesday we're not going to meet here. We're going to meet in various groupings. Now that is so that I felt it's very unfair to ask people questions or to ask people to share their problems or to open up and say anything uh, particularly uh, publicly. I didn't want that to happen because I think it's unfair on people upset when the Holy Ghost tells me to call them out and embarrass them. And then I will. But apart from that, I don't like doing it. And I think it will be good. Now the groups are not, may I emphasize, the groups are not to start little churches in houses. We are not in our house groups. Uh, I do not agree with them, I've never believed in them and I never will. What they are for is so that you can get to know other brethren in the church, so you can begin to share together, talk about things, express any misunderstandings you have, find out, ask questions, but really just have fellowship. It's a chance to fellowship on one Wednesday week with different people. And I thought that would be a good idea, so you didn't always get locked up with us four no more. And then to say, God bless us. Us four no more. Amen. That's a terrible thing. And we need to open up. Now, we always used to have a, an opportunity to do that at the public hall. We used to have parties every two months or three months with mad games and Englishmen. And, and, and we, we absolutely learned and then we had a lot of uh, things to do. Now, the church has changed. Time has changed us a bit. But I think the need for just getting to know each other is a good thing. And I think the need to be able to communicate with someone who's older in Christ and to be able to feel that you've got someone who you can ask and who is there and who would know and who'd been there at that time to be able to tell you roughly right. Eh? And, and if it's not right, then I shall soon find out about it. Beyond their tail. So it's split up into groups. Now, the various group leaders, if you want to call them group leaders or call them what you will, are, are going to be uh, Alan and Lois, uh, Robert Meadry, David and Jill, Peter and Carolyn, George and Rachel, and Colin and Joanne. And they, they've got uh, people helping them. There's Chris Nanfield and Mary, uh, Jamie Nestor, Charlie and Sue, Stephen Sheila, Robin Shane, and Jean Claude and Sue. Now, the second lot of people have just been here a long time. Sometimes I put it there because the husband knows more and sometimes it's the wife who knows more. But basically they've been around at the time. Okay? And then the people are just, all of you are in one of those groupings. Now, there's nothing compulsory about it. It's just suggested it'd be good for you to have a chance to fellowship on a Wednesday night. Just have a nice, friendly, don't go with your Bible under your arm and think you're going to have a great theological discussion. That is not what it's about. It's about having a chance just to fellowship, to love one another, get to know one another, and enjoy fellowship and, and share questions. Okay? Is that clear enough? Because what I do not want is the idea that we're going to have 60 house churches uh, and we're going to develop a mushroom because we don't want to do that. I believe that the church is New Jerusalem. I believe the church is the living body which is the family. Okay? But these are just what you can call, no, I better not use it. I was going to say, you could call them something like that, Matthews, 
trust, but they nurture groups, was it? Um, don't you dare call it that. Uh, that name came to mind. It's just fellowship groups, and they're just fellowship. It's a chance to have fellowship together. Okay? Now, those people will meet, and um, what's the best thing to do? Major, have you got copies of Who's what? Well, just stick one up on the notice board, and then you can look and see uh, who, who you're with. And, and we have tried to fit you in. Now, you might find that you're not with someone that you know very well, and that's totally intentional. Uh, but it, it's only that we've really prayed about it and thought about it, and I really feel we've got to care for one another, and as a family, grow up and, and see how best we can help people. Okay? Anyway, thank you for coming. Thank you for being patient. Now next time, we're going to deal with either the gifts of the Spirit or the <coughs> But when you go to your groups, if you have any questions, thoughts, or, or things you don't understand, you'll have a good chance to open up and ask the people in that group. When that's next Wednesday. Okay? Well, thank you for having those questions. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, Alan and Lotus group will be at Chris and Anthony's. Robin Major's group will be at Robin Major's. David Jules group will be at David Jules. Peter and Carolyn's group will be at Peter and Carolyn's. George and Rachel will be at George and Rachel. Colin and Giants will be at Colin and Giants. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so remember that. Um, but the, the group leader will no doubt give you a personal invitation and tell you, I, I would imagine it would be, uh, what, quarter to eight or eight o'clock? Um, pardon? Eight o'clock. Okay, eight o'clock. And it, it really is a time to have a cup of tea and a sandwich and a chat and, and just to get to know someone else. Okay? okay. So you've got well in on Friday when we're going on with that glorious subject of thrilling praise called Joe.